I want to talk about the events of 6 January at the Capitol of the United States, the Capitol building. You remember the day, it was a Wednesday. That's when, depending on your view, the mostly peaceful protesters, the mob or the insurrectionists stormed into the Capitol building, or alternatively, depending on which videos you've seen, were allowed into the Capitol building by the Capitol Police. When I saw that, my reaction to that was, oh my God, I mean, this is, this is really bad. Now, I didn't feel that way because I was somehow surprised. I mean, after all, I've been predicting in video after video after video that we are headed toward a civil war. You know, this is what civil war looks like. If you're going to have a civil war, you're going to see stuff like this. So in that sense, I wasn't surprised. I certainly wasn't shocked. What I was sort of taken aback by was I really didn't think, well, I've been predicting this for years, that I was going to actually live to see it. I thought, you know, I'm until the end of my life, maybe I'll, if I'm lucky, maybe it was wishful thinking, I'll die before I ever have to see this country descend into civil war. So what really got to me on that Wednesday was the realization that this may happen before I die. I may end my life living through the second, or the way I would count them, the third American Civil War. By the weekend, as my analytic historical brain started kicking in, something new popped into my mind. It wasn't about Civil War. It wasn't about what had happened on Wednesday. It wasn't about interpretations. It wasn't about condemnations. It wasn't about condonations. It was about the Reichstag fire. The Reichstag fire in Berlin in February 1933. Why did that pop into my mind? Why did I start thinking about that? And I've continued to think about it since. And the reason's basically simple. If you understand anything about the rise of Hitler, about the demise of the Weimar Republic, you know the story of a Reichstag fire. And if you don't, you know, there, just search on YouTube. There are videos that will explain it to you. But as somebody who's studied history, European history, too, as not just American history, uh, since I was little, I mean, one of the first things I read when I was small, somebody gave, my grandfather gave me, it was a copy of William Schreier's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. And in there is the story of the Reichstag fire. So my whole life, I've been reading about and thinking about and teaching about on occasion the Reichstag fire. And what's important historically about the Reichstag fire isn't the fact that the Reichstag, the German parliament, the German capital building burned down in February 1933. That's not really the important part of the story. There's still disputes about who burned it down. A Dutch communist was a part of a larger communist conspiracy. Was it an inside job uh, uh, set up by the Nazis themselves, led by Hitler? All of those possibilities are indeed possible. And historians go back and forth, and there's not really, I guess if there's a, a conventional account, it said it was a lone Dutch communist who set fire to the building. It wasn't part of a grand communist conspiracy, and that the Nazis didn't actually do it. And after all, the Nazis kept really good records of everything they did. And Nobody has ever come up with documentary evidence that would show that, yes, this was an inside job by them. But when you study the Reichstag fire, it doesn't really matter who burnt the building down. The important part of the story of a Reichstag fire in world history, in human history, is how the crisis was played by the people in power. What happened? You know, Hitler had come to power January 30th, 19. 33 as chancellor. New elections, the parliament was sent home by the president, von Hindenburg. New elections were sent for the 5th of March. So Hitler has not a lot of time, you know, less than two months to set up a government and try to get something done. Because the Germans, while they were the biggest, the Nazis were the biggest party in the parliament, they weren't the majority. They wanted to become a majority. That's what they need to do in March at the elections. And here it is. It's four weeks to the day after Hitler becomes chancellor. A Reichstag burns down. 
What happens after that? Hitler, von Hindenburg, they, they catch the Dutch Nazi. They think, ah, this could be a larger communist conspiracy. They start using the words insurrection. They start telling people, yeah, we've just got this one guy, but they arrested other people who were members of the Comintern, including the head of the Comintern, although they didn't even know he was head of the Comintern, Bulgarian. And they start telling the German people this was part of an insurrection. We need to take action. This is dangerous. The people are trying to overthrow the Weimar Republic, which indeed they were. The people, we know who the people were now. They were called the Nazis. They were led by Adolf Hitler. Between them, Hitler and Hindenburg agree that the president will issue what become the Reichstag decree the next day, which basically starts limiting uh, meetings, shuts down left-wing presses, gives the government the power to tap phones. Remember, they don't have internet in those days. How do you communicate? Mail and telephone. And the government gets the power to intercept the mail and open it and tap and listen in on people's phones, phone calls. The communist papers, the communist leaning papers are all closed. Communist meetings and assemblies and marches are forbidden. The Nazis can still march, though. And of course, by the time you get to the election on March 5th, the Germans still, even with all these advantages, don't win a majority. But they increase their margin in the Reichstag and in union with another German nationalist party, gives them 52% of the seats. And then they can move forward and eventually pass what's called the Enabling Decree, which it puts what Hindenburg's Reichstag Fire Decree into law for three years, renewable. And of course, they'll renew it after that. And this law basically bans everything's shut down. The communists are, they can't vote. And I should add, in the March 5th election, one of the reasons that Hitler and his uh, partner party managed to get 52% of the vote was because the communists weren't allowed to vote. They didn't run candidates. And the communists, under the wise direction of Joseph Stalin, their view was they wouldn't support, I mean, they believed uh, that, that Hitler was a fascist, but they considered the social, anybody who wasn't a communist was a fascist. You have to understand that with Antifa being anti-fascist. I posted a video about that. I'll, I'll link to it here. Everybody was a fascist, not just the Nazis. They were fighting the Nazis. They were fighting the Social Democrats. They were fighting the Catholic Center Party. They were fighting every uh, uh, monarchical or royalist party. They were fighting everybody. So if you were a communist in Germany and you can't vote for a communist, you don't vote. So the proportion of the vote then for the Nazis rose and the Nazis with their partner gets 52% of the vote and they pass the Enabling Act, thank to the, stu to the stupidity of Joseph Stalin, the common turn and the German communist. And that's the end. That's it. You're on you know full course now, full speed down the highway to the Third Reich and everything that comes after that. The Enabling Act basically leaves Hitler in charge. And shortly thereafter, when Hindenburg dies and Hitler assumes that office as well as chancellor and becomes Fuhrer, uh, it's all over. As Stalin hoped, Hitler's accession to power would destroy the Weimar Republic. It did. Stalin was right. Unfortunately, it didn't get replaced with a communist government. It was replaced by the Third Reich and Adolf Hitler. What's that have to do with us today? And what happened in the Capitol back on the 6th of January? I think everything. What you need to do is to keep your eye on the ball. Don't let press the digitators you know, distract you, magicians, sleight of hand. You know, here, here, see this? Trump impeachment. You know, ask yourself, what are they doing with the right hand? Now, maybe they're not doing anything. Maybe you think they're not doing anything. That's fine. But keep your eye on that right hand just in case.
keep in mind what how Hitler played this, his opportunity, the Reichstag fire. What did he claim when it burnt down? They were responsible for the attack on the house that belonged to the German people. You know, it says right on the top there, dem Volkische or dem Deutschen Volke, the German people. This is their house. The communist, a, a communist at least, although Hitler claimed the communist, burned it down. This was an attempted insurrection. Does that sound familiar? And what do we need to do? We need to stop these potential insurrectionists, although there's no evidence that there was any communist insurrection plan. This was just one guy. We can't let these people meet. We can't let them have rallies. We can't let them hold marches. We can't let them have newspapers. We can't let them have pamphleteering. We can't let them have anything where they can communicate with one another. That would just make it easier for them to carry off their planned insurrection. And to keep an eye on them, we have to get into what was the social media of the day. We're going to open their mail, and we're going to listen in on their phone calls. That's how the Nazis took advantage of the burning of the Reichstag fire. That's the story of a Reichstag fire. It's not who burned it down or what happened. It's how the Nazis used it to cement their political power. And that's what scares me. Because, you know, Wednesday, I'm thinking, bad news, <laughs> attack on the Capitol. But by the weekend, it's like, whoa, this looks familiar. Claims of insurrection. Where have I heard this before? Shutting down media outlets, social media outlets. Where have I heard that before? And that's, that's whoa. It's, it's starting to look like the Reichstag fire. Now, hopefully, this isn't going to play out like the Reichstag fire. But it could. And if you don't keep your eyes open, if you get distracted by what's going on over here, and it certainly looks like they're attempting to distract us, you don't know what's going on down here. Let me just give you a, a, a small sampling. I've talked about this before. I'm on Twitter. I don't have a huge following on Twitter. I'm not one of these people with you know hundreds of thousands or millions of followers on Twitter. Over the years, I managed, I got up to about 10,000. Every time I get up to 10,000, they shut me down a little bit and I can't quite get there. But I'm around 10,000, or I should say, I was around 10,000 right before the election on November 3rd. Since November 3rd, I'm under 7,000. I've lost 3,000 of my followers that it took me a decade to get in two months. 3,000. That's over 30% of the people who followed me have suddenly disappeared. And I have an app that lets me go in and shows me who's left and, you know, why. And I go in and I look. You know, I've given up looking, but I know what it is every day. Account suspended. Account suspended. Account suspended. Account suspended. They're nailing little people. There's a woman I know on Facebook. She's not somebody that you know, is, is influencing loads of people. She's not like General Flynn or something. She shut down. And you got all these people, 3,000 people, followers on Twitter, accounts are all gone. 30% of my followers have been disappeared. You know, under, under Stalin, they had what they called the Black Mariahs. These were like these black, sometimes vehicles, sometimes trucks, and they would just drive down the street and they'd grab people. Sometimes they'd go in a house and grab people. Sometimes they'd just be people walking down the street. They'd grab them, they'd throw them into the Black Mariah and, you know, next stop was the gulag. If they were lucky, if they were unlucky, they were shot in the back of the head and dumped somewhere in the woods outside of Moscow. They were called Black Mariahs. And it's like there's these digital, virtual Black Mariahs sweeping through the Twitterverse you know, dragging people, throwing people into the back and taking them off and sending them into the digital gulag. 
And this is what's been going on. This is the, you know, why this is going up here and, and Pelosi's talking about insurrection. Down here, Twitter's eliminating a third of my followers. Not because they're trying to get at me, trying to knock my 10,000 down to under seven. That's not my point. But these are 3,000 individuals who have had their accounts suspended that I know of. How many others are there? Somebody going to, in Congress going to ask Twitter, how many people have you suspended since the election? Once it became clear that Biden had won, I'd love to know. I'm a little guy, and I've seen 3,000 people disappear. What about the people who have 100,000 followers? How many people have they seen disappear? Or a million followers? Of course, those people are themselves shut down. They've mostly, many of them, I shouldn't say mostly, but many of them have been disappeared. Donald Trump's been disappeared. His account was hauled off to the digital gulag. Both accounts, his presidential account as well. And that's why I'm worried. You know, I see Nancy Pelosi call for an insurrection and I start thinking back, you know, to the Reichstag fire incident. Is this how this is going to be played? 20 years, 30 years from now, will we look back at what happened at the Capitol on 6th of January and say, that's not all important. That's not really the story. The story is how the Democrats use the incident to shut down dissent in this country after the 6th of January. What do you think? Let me know in a comment. Like the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos, share it with your friends. And until the next time, keep fighting.